As winter starts to wane and everyone's looking forward to spring, and I know we all are at the moment, Paul Hobson is arguing that it's one of the best times of the year for wildlife and nature photographers. Paul shows us how we can make great pictures from the small white snowdrops that pop up all over UK gardens. Although winter is a great season for the photographer, we all hanker after the first signs of spring. Those early indicators are often a simple riff from a robin or a dunnock, but none comes more visibly impressive than a woodland carpeted with thousands of these small white flowers. Snowdrops are now grown with incredible passion. A single bulb last year sold for over £300, and galanthophiles collect and grow these stunning little plants, producing amazing displays every year. It's unclear if the common snowdrop, Galanthus nivalis, is native to Britain. They have been here for hundreds of years. The Romans may have introduced them, or they may have been here all along, peeping out of the leaf litter in woodlands in late winter. Soldiers from the Crimean War returned with a large variety, and this was crossed with the snowdrops already here, producing the common type seen today. Snowdrops have featured heavily in our folklore, and were once associated with the church when they were known as Candlemas bells. They were often grown around churches and flowered at the same time as the old religious festival, Candlemas, which is in February. Perhaps the most delightful fact about snowdrops is the word galanthus. Carl Linnaeus chose this term when he gave the snowdrop its Latin name, meaning milky plants of the snow. Snowdrops, the low-growing members of the lily family, appear any time from late January to April, though in most winters they are often in abundance by February. Although with our weather at the moment, they may just be peeking out now. The common form has three white inner petals with a single green marking and three pure white drooping outer petals. There are 20 species, but when the amazing interest now shown, many different varieties are existing. As winter still has a couple of months to shiver the bones, snowdrops offer the nature photographer the ultimate late winter tonic. I love to spend at least a few days every February working at one of the cracking displays near to where I live. I also use this experience as a way of experimenting with any new ideas I have about flower photography before summer comes. But how do you photograph snowdrops? Flowers always seem easier to work with than birds or insects because they cannot uproot and run off. In a way, they are a captive audience, waiting for you to do your best. I always remind myself that this often fools me into thinking it's easy, and consequently speeding up my approach. I now consciously slow down when I work with flowers. I take a flask and spend a lot of time considering my work at each point of the day and where my next image will come from. It's important that you find your own style, but it's always a good idea to keep an open mind. I have become mesmerised by the approach to plant photography in other European countries. Many see the natural world in a different way, and it's now easy to see styles developed elsewhere appearing in British wildlife photography. I am heavily influenced by many German and Scandinavian plant photographers. They seem to be able to paint masterpieces with their cameras. The typical approach is to place the camera on a tripod and photograph at an angle looking down onto the snowdrops. This is easy on the knees and keeps your clothes clean, but unless you're looking for a plantscape wide angle image, it will challenge the depth of field. I love a low position of view, and for snowdrops it's advantageous because it will allow a better chance of keeping the short upright plant sharp from top to bottom. If you choose to lie down, a couple of things need consideration. Most important of all is that you must check exactly where you will lie. It will be a real disaster, if not incredibly embarrassing, if you get to see an outlined six foot human patch of very flat snowdrops. I always check exactly where my body, arms and tripod will be so that I don't do any damage to any of the plants. Probably the best bet is to use a path or track and photograph the flowers from there. You may get an odd look or remark. I was once asked if I had had a heart attack. Depth of field is a serious issue to consider. How much of each flower in the background do you want sharp? I increasingly use a low depth of field, setting the aperture to f-stop 4 or f-stop 5.6 and get blurry backgrounds. However, this often won't allow for all of the flower I am working on to be sharp. It may be that you want to isolate the inner green markings and leave the outer petals blurred. If you want to shoot a group of flowers and keep a good sharp depth of field, use f-stop 16 or even higher. This brings in another consideration. Will you use a tripod or will you hold it by hand? I nearly always use a tripod for a number of reasons. It allows me to fine tune my composition so I can spend time considering the image, checking the corners for things creeping in. Light levels are fairly low when you'll be doing this, even on sunny days, so a tripod means I can keep the camera steady and use a cable release, or the self-timer. The last consideration is a straight horizon. When you are lying down, it's easy to assume it's straight, but beware, a small spirit level on the hot shoe can be a lifesaver. These are inexpensive and easy to pick up from any camera shop. 
If light levels do drop, don't forget to increase your ISO, resulting in an increased shutter speed and avoid getting camera shape. So how do you use the light? Many photographers work with the sun behind them, giving an even amount of front lighting. For simple, well-lit portraits this is ideal, but always check where your shadow falls. It's longer and more of a problem in early spring, because the sun is low in the sky. Backlighting, however, has become increasingly popular and allows a really moody feel to your images. The main idea is to have the sun almost shining into your lens and through the petals of the snowdrops. I love the effect this brings, but I know that exposure is a real issue. Always check on the histogram or look at the image in the shade of the back of your camera. It's very subjective how much light you want to flood the image, so experiment with auto exposure bracketing or try different exposures using your exposure compensation. Depending on whether you want any flare, be sure to use your lens hood and make sure your optics are free from dust and grime too. Both can induce flare. Once you have a selection of shots lying down, try somewhere wide angle. The simplest is a landscape showing a mass of snowdrops in a scene. Looking down is now the best vantage point. Experiment with various apertures to find out what you like best. Composition is still critical. Consider where the clumps of snowdrops are and try for a balance in the image. Another approach is to shoot up into the flowers using a wide angle, placing the camera on the ground so that the sky becomes a major influence in the shot. You will need to check out the exposure and adjust accordingly for an underexposed flower. In a few places, such as Hopton Hall in Derbyshire, snowdrops flower alongside the butter yellow of winter aconites. These are stunning little flowers and will allow a new element to be built into your day's photography. So where can you find the best places to photograph snowdrops? Here are Paul's top five places. Many occur in normal gardens. You may actually have a patch in your own, as I do. However, I find it best to head out to one of the really impressive places locally. These are easy to find on the web. A simple search reveals loads of sites, some listing the best places to enjoy the milky mist of spring. Once you have chosen your venue, it's quite easy to either phone or use the web to pick the prime time when the delicate little blooms are at their best. My favourite place is Hodstock, Priory and Knotts, but other places to try are Chippenham Park, Hopton Hall, Eastern Lodge and Dudmaston. This is not a definite list, there are loads of other stunning places dotted right around the country, but you're more likely to find them on your way round and from work, or while out and about, so always go prepared. So what kit would Paul recommend? Paul tends to take with him a DSLR, macro lens 70 to 200 mil or medium telephoto, extension tubes if you're using a non-macro lens, a tripod that opens flat if possible, or a bean bag with your tripod a blanket to lie on, small spirit level for those wonky horizons and a cable release, and don't forget your spare cards, a charged battery, and, and most importantly, a big flask of tea. But what if you don't have all that and you've just got a compact? Well, snowdrops are ideal candidates for shooting with compact cameras, as most have very good macro settings to allow for extreme close-ups. Find the shooting mode with the flower on, just remember to give the camera time to focus. A point to remember is that the smaller sensors in the compacts produce an increased depth of field effect over, say, a DSLR lens. This makes blurred backgrounds harder to achieve. If your image comes out blurred while hand-holding your compact, increase the ISO number or turn on the camera's flash. A higher ISO will allow faster shutter speeds and reduce the chance of movement blur while exposing, while the flash will freeze movement even in daylight. And that's all on Snowdrops from this audio special of Photography Monthly magazine. We'd like to see what flowers you've spotted out at the moment. So as always, you can send them to the gallery at www.photographymonthly.com gallery.